Now, chairing this lecture on ministries for the future has given me a prompt to read Kim Stanley Robinson's novel of speculative fiction. Um, it's a quite extraordinary piece of work. I was discussing it with some of my students today. Um, it's kind of straightforwardly and very firmly didactic. And yet, at the same time, there's this kind of brilliant adventure story running alongside it, utterly compelling. So maybe that combination of didacticism and compelling is exactly what we're all looking for all the time. Um, perhaps more importantly, chairing this lecture gave me a lovely excuse to sit down for a few hours with Ellen's outstanding work on the regulation of new technologies and the relationship between law and the future. Now, Ellen um, carries and has always carried the brilliance of her scholarship very modestly. Um, her work is characterised by great imagination and a very loyally doctrinal care and attention, as well as, I must say, a real scholarly generosity. So it is um, a great pleasure to hand over to Professor Stokes to talk to us on ministries for the future in environmental law. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, I'm so pleased to be here with you all today. It's such a great privilege to have been invited. Um, I'm very nervous about this because it's my first big outing in a few years. Um, and we're surrounded by such esteemed guests um, in person and online, including my parents who are here this evening. Um, also, I'm quite out of practice um, at giving a lecture without being able to hit pause and re-record. <laughs> so I'm sorry to say you're going to get the unedited version this evening, gaffes <laughs> and all. I have several people to thank, but I'm going to leave that until the end because otherwise I'll get a wobbly bottom lip if that's okay. But I'd just like to say um, how much it means to me that you're all here with me this evening. And I know that um, it, it's no easy ask to give up time uh, at the minute. So thank you very, very much. I'm particularly happy to see so many students um, and to see so many students, uh, including secondary school pupils who signed up to listen to this online. Um, and I hope that what I have to say will be of some interest and maybe of some use to you when you come to write your essays and dissertations in the coming months. I've chosen to speak about the relationship between the future and environmental law, not with the aim of providing a firm view, but to invite thought and debate around the issue. Now, the relationship between law and the future is a theme that is of relevance across all fields of legal study, but it is of obvious significance in the protection uh, of the environment against long-term harms. Of all the legal fields, environmental law is among the most future-oriented. Environmental laws are all the time made and implemented in the name of the future, on the basis of what has not happened and may never happen. Law, in fact, is one of the most powerful societal means of bringing the future into the present. By studying law, we learn something about how the future is imagined, known, understood and experienced in the here and now. But we don't often think about law in those terms. Here is a brief example of something that is currently being looked at in Wales. As many of you will know, Wales was very famous for its coal mining. Nowadays, there are some 2,000 disused coal tips in Wales. A coal tip is a pile of accumulated waste material. Now, if you know something of the geography of South Wales in particular, you will know that there are lots of steep-sided valleys. Some coal tips are very large, and some coal tips are positioned at the top of those steep slopes. In February 2020, a storm from the Atlantic, Storm Dennis, brought high winds and heavy rain to much of the UK, but particularly to Wales. Red weather warnings were issued. Natural Resources Wales, which is Wales' main environmental regulator, recorded the equivalent of half a month's rainfall in 12 hours. The rainfall caused the disused Llan Wano upper tip, which is on the side of the Rhondavach Valley, to slide. 60,000 tonnes of saturated spoil slid from the tip, blocking the Rondavach River, breaking a foul sewer and burying a strategic water main under several metres of debris. <coughs> the immediate costs of remediation of removing that material from the river was £2.5 million, 
and it is estimated that permanent remediation will cost between 10 and 12 million pounds. A few months later, there was a further landslide from a different disused tip, but a few miles down the same valley. The current regulatory framework is underpinned by the Mines and Quarries Act, enacted in 1969 following the Aberfan disaster of 1966. Last year, at the Welsh Government's request, the Law Commission began a review of the legislation and concluded that the 1969 Act does not provide effective management for disused coal tips in the 21st century. What led to that conclusion? In part, it has to do with how the future in the mid to late 1960s was conceived. The 1969 Act, explains the Law Commission, was created on the basis of, and I quote, faith in the help provided by an active industry, the belief that disused tips were unlikely to slide, and the hope that there would be further legislation to combat the environmental issues caused by the tips. So the future, as envisaged at the time, entailed three things. The continuance of an active industry, a low chance of coal tip failure, and additional complementary legislation. None of those futures transpired as imagined. The point is not that anybody could have been expected to have perfect 2020 vision into the future. As the Law Commission rightly says, Parliament could not at the time have predicted that so many tips would become disused or the environmental challenges that would affect the stability of those, uh, of those tips. Instead, what the example shows, I think, it highlights the sorts of questions we might want to ask about the relationship between law and the future. What assumptions about the future inform and shape the law? Which conceptions of the future become lodged in legal regimes and persist long after situations have changed? What consequences follow from acting on the basis of those futures? There are lots of different ways one might approach such a big topic, but I'm particularly interested in two angles or two different sets of questions that might help us to make sense of how environmental law imagines the future, what it does with the future, and to what effect. The first angle, which will take up most of my talk, is the legal institutionalisation of futures thinking. I will discuss new legal and policy institutions, which I refer to as ministries of the future, that are empowered to deal with long-term issues and to act in the interests of future generations in a systematic manner. I will look in closer detail at the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales, and I will consider some of the practical challenges faced in implementing the underpinning legislation. The second angle, which is slightly different, and I'll deal with that much more briefly because it is work in progress, on which I'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, but the second angle takes a more theoretical direction, and it looks at the sorts of contributions that legal scholars and students might make to academic thinking on futures. So the bottom line is, I think that the literature on the future is huge, but for the moment, it is insufficiently legal. Let's begin with the first angle then that I mentioned, the legal institutionalization of futures thinking. Those of you here today who are studying environmental law modules at UCL have already learned about the principles of environmental law and policy. And you've learned that they are designed to take account of the future. Principles that in one way or another involve acts of deducing the future, of giving weight to anticipated costs and benefits, uh, and using that as a basis for making decisions in the present. For example, decisions about clear risks of harm in the case of the prevention principle, or decisions about plausible but uncertain risks in the case of the precautionary principle. Environmental principles are inherently temporal, and their implementation can reveal interesting things about how the future is conceived. For example, they may be underpinned by a sense of the future as a knowable, measurable, controllable domain. Some of you will come to study climate change law, and examine the emissions reductions targets enshrined in international legal frameworks. Think about the temporal rhythms that you will encounter there. Notice that the future is always a really nice round number away in five or ten years, and if we're thinking really long term, in 2050. 
The point is that when you study environmental law, it is simply impossible to escape the future. The bit that has interested me lately is not so much the individual principles or targets or decisions, but what is happening at an institutional level. The new futures-focused institutions that are created with the promotion of future-oriented policies as their main or exclusive purpose. Which is what led me to Kim Stanley Robinson's recent venture into the near future, the Ministry for the Future. A harrowing tale of the vast, horrifying consequences of climate catastrophe, political violence and economic depression. In short, the book explores how we could respond to such disaster and it sets a path towards a post-carbon -car utopia. It charts the efforts of scientists, engineers, economists, lawyers and diplomats to push decarbonisation even without having the necessary powers of enforcement. Early on in the story, we are introduced to a new subsidiary body of the UN established in 2025, tasked with defending all creatures, present and future, who cannot speak for themselves. A body that comes to be known as the Ministry for the Future, and that struck a chord. The general idea of the ministry, and by which I mean the existence of some form of institutionalised futures thinking, is not outlandish or beyond the realms of reality at all. In that respect, at least, we are living in Kim Stanley Robinson's science fiction. Consider these examples. Israel was the first country to establish a commission of future generations, which had extensive investigative and advisory powers including the power to examine and make recommendations in respect of any parliamentary bill that it reasoned would have a significant impact on future generations. The idea, as the former Future Generations Commissioner explained, was to create a space within the Parliament in which desired futures could be conceptualised and pursued. Hungary, similarly, established the position of Parliamentary Commissioner for Future Generations, the commissioner there effectively acted as an ombudsperson whose primary task was to protect the common heritage and resources held in common, which the Hungarian constitution at the time listed as including forests, reserves of water, biodiversity and native plant and animal species. These early examples of institutionalised futures thinking were groundbreaking, but they didn't survive in the form I've just described. In Hungary, the Commissioner's Office was subsumed within the more general Commission for Fundamental Rights. The Israeli Commission was disbanded after only one term. Still, similar ideas and institutional arrangements have emerged over time. And there is now a real groundswell of political interest in and commitment to the creation of institutions whose core business is promoting futures thinking in legislative and policy activity. Other examples include the Committee for the Future in Finland and the tantalisingly named Ministry of Possibilities in the United Arab Emirates. The Scottish Government has recently appointed a Future Generations Commissioner and Scotland's Futures Forum is the Scottish Parliament's think tank which works across political parties to promote research and stimulate debate on Scotland's long-term future. This year, the UN Secretary General proposed a new UN Special Envoy for Future Generations, as well as, not, un not uncontroversially, a repurposed trusteeship council to serve as a deliberative forum to act on behalf of successive generations. Uh, being from Ponte de Lais, near Swansea, and working at Cardiff Law School, I am very interested in one example in particular. The Office of the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales which was created by the Wellbeing of Future Generations Wales Act in 2015. Wales is the first country in the world to have specifically legislated in this manner for the protection of future generations. Put simply, the Act provides an overarching framework for the decision-making of public bodies, and it aims to make the Wellbeing of Future Generations the touchstone of public administration in Wales. It requires public bodies in Wales to consider the long-term impact of their decisions and it seeks to improve the country's social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being. There are currently 44 public bodies 
subject to the duties of the Act, and they include the Welsh ministers, local authorities, Public Health Wales, the Arts Council of Wales, the National Library and National Museum, and Natural Resources Wales. Each public body must set well-being objectives in line with the seven well-being goals for Wales. The seven well-being goals for Wales are a prosperous Wales, a resilient Wales, a healthier Wales, a more equal Wales, a Wales of cohesive communities, a Wales of vibrant culture and a thriving Welsh language, and a globally responsible Wales. These goals all aim at implementing the principle of sustainable development set out in Section 2 of the Act, which is elaborated in the Act by requiring the public bodies to work uh, and adapt, uh, adopt five ways of working. Those five ways of working are thinking long-term, so balancing the short-term needs uh, with the, the need to safeguard the ability of uh, future generations to um, meet their own needs, taking an integrated approach by considering how the public body's well-being objectives may impact upon each of the well-being goals, involving all interested parties in decision-making and ensuring that those persons reflect the diversity of the population of Wales, acting in collaboration with any person who could assist the public body to meet its well-being objectives and deploying resources to prevent problems from occurring or getting worse. So long-term thinking, integration, involvement, collaboration and prevention. The Act requires that public bodies report on the progress they are making against their own well-being objectives. The Welsh ministers have an additional obligation to publish national indicators to measure progress towards the achievement of Wales' well-being goals. Plus, they must report uh, uh, predicting the future trends in economic, social, environmental and cultural well-being in Wales. Now, that future trend report fits into other regulatory regimes. It must take into account any action taken by the UN in relation to the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the UK's climate change risk assessment reports that have been generated under the Climate Ch Change Act 2008. Certainly, the Future Generations Act in Wales is ambitious. Whether or not that ambition is met, or indeed is capable of being met, has divided opinion, for reasons that I will outline now. The Act has been criticised for being little more than aspirational, for being drafted at a high level of generality without the mechanisms needed to resolve conflict. The Act is described as an example of legislation which bears no law, to borrow a phrase from David Feldman, meaning legislation that has the appearance of imposing a legal obligation, but which does not, in fact, affect the lawfulness of anything because the obligation, by its very nature, could never be enforced through legal proceedings. There is some evidence of this. There have been a couple of attempts by individuals to seek a judicial review of decisions by public bodies in Wales on the basis that those public bodies failed in their decision-making to apply the provisions of the Act. In each case, the Administrative Court refused permission to bring proceedings because the well-being duty was too vague, too general, too aspirational to be enforced in that way. As a result, the Act has been ridiculed as toothless and virtually useless. But that isn't the whole picture. In a study published last year, led by Sarah Nason and Anne Sherlock at Bangor Law School, including my Cardiff colleague Hugh Pritchard, it, uh, it was pointed out that no precedent has been set and the justiciability of, of duties under the Future Generations Act remains an open issue. A couple of further points can be made. The first is that judicial review is just one route to the Act's enforceability. And it is not necessarily the model of enforcement that we should be single-mindedly aiming for. You may know that a Wellbeing of Future Generations UK bill was introduced into the House of Lords in 2019 by Lord Bird, founder of The Big Issue, and presented to the House of Commons the following year by Green Party MP Caroline Lucas. The, the bill found uh, cross-party support, but it wasn't supported by government, and so never completed its passage through Parliament and wasn't enacted. Still, I think it shows that the subject matter is not something that is parochially Welsh. Uh, 
the UK bill was identical to the Wales Act in almost all respects. One notable difference, however, was that the bill made provision for an express legal right enforceable by a person to bring proceedings in the High Court against a public body on the basis that the public body acted in a way that breached its future generation's obligations. This was seen as an important means for avoiding the remedial deficiencies, for want of a better phrase, of the Future Generations Act in Wales. Yet, the heavy focus on judicial review, both by detractors of the Act in Wales and by supporters of the UK Bill, is not free of problems. For one thing, it risks reducing the protection of future generations to the administration of individual justice. I'm not saying that judicial review could not serve a purpose in this context, but it is important to keep in mind that there are very real disparities in access to justice, which would mean that even if the future generation's obligations were regarded as justiciable, judicial review is not, not equally available to everyone. This is especially so in Wales, which has seen the largest decline in legal aid providers compared with other parts of the UK. The public law research group at Bangor University has also noted the relatively limited availability of specialist administrative law advice provision outside the main urban areas of South Wales. So giving the Future Generations Act sharper enforcement teeth is not necessarily the answer, and indeed it raises equally thorny questions about how we hold public bodies to account. A second related point is that the Future Generations Act in Wales already provides for some means of enforcement. The Act creates the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner, currently held by Sophie Howe. The Commissioner's general duty is to act as a guardian of the ability of future generations to meet their needs, and to that end, to monitor and assess the extent to which well-being objectives set by public bodies are being met. The Commissioner has various powers, including a power under Section 20 to conduct a review of the conduct of a public body to report non-compliance with the Act. The Commissioner may make recommendations about the wellbeing goals or national indicators, and a public body has a qualified duty to take all reasonable steps to follow the Commissioner's recommendations. So far, the Commissioner has exercised her Section 20 powers on one occasion to review the procurement practices of nine public bodies. The Commissioner recommended, for example, that in order to achieve the Welsh Government's ambition for the public sector to be carbon neutral by 2030, every public body should set out how they have considered carbon, the carbon impact of their procurement decisions and, in the case of construction and infrastructure contracts, should require schemes to be net zero carbon over their lifetime. The Auditor General for Wales, which is the statutory external auditor of the Welsh public sector, is also under a statutory duty under Section 15 of the Act to assess the extent to which public bodies have acted in accordance with the sustainable development principle when setting their wellbeing objectives and, and taking steps to meet them. Between 2018 and 2020, the Auditor, auditor General's office carried out 71 examinations across the 44 public bodies. The examinations have covered a wide range of topics, such as the financial resilience of local councils and stakeholder involvement in the decision-making of national park authorities. What can we make of all of this? Well, a tremendous amount of scrutiny of how the Act is being implemented, certainly. Not just by the Commissioner and the Auditor General, but also the Public Accounts Committee of Senedd Cymru, which is the Welsh Parliament. There is no shortage of reporting. And, as you might expect, it is not unco uncommon to hear the criticisms about how the Act is not so much about the protection of the future as it is about the bureaucratisation of the future. Several barriers to implementation have been identified in the major reviews conducted so far. They include a lack of demonstrable leadership and tangible progress within Welsh Government in the early days of the Act's operation the creation of an unnecessarily complex uh, governance landscape causing confusion, wasted resources and frustration for public bodies. Public bodies' short-term budgetary cycles with late notification of available funds, which ha hampers long-term planning. Mm 
a lack of clarity on the division of powers between the Commissioner and the Auditor General, and the risk of recommendation overload. Some of the barriers described are the sorts of teething troubles that you might expect of any new regime. Some barriers are already beginning to be addressed. For example, the Commissioner and the Auditor General have entered into a memorandum of understanding that sets out their respective responsibilities to avoid overlap and duplication between their offices. Some issues are systemic, such as the limited resources of local authorities and other public service providers to put sustainable development and the interests of future generations at the centre of all they do. Those, di those issues are very difficult to resolve and it is, it is important not to underplay the serious pressures that public bodies find themselves under. What is noticeable, however, is how those systemic problems are often attributed to the Act, rather than to the wider implications of the politics of austerity, for, for example, and how the immediate response of critics is typically to scrap the Act, scrap the Commission, rather than for steps to be taken to address the ver very challenging context in which public bodies and indeed the Future Generations Commissioner's Office operate. It is quite understandable why the Act is sometimes seen as an inconvenience. Yet the Act is, by its very nature, designed to disrupt the usual way of doing things. It is on some level meant to be inconvenient. What of the criticism that the Act is so aspirational, so tentative, as to be rendered virtually useless? It is true that the well-being duty and the principle of sustainable development are not narrowly or prescriptively defined, nor for that matter is the meaning of future generations, and I think that's something that's interesting and worth bearing in mind. It is also the case that this makes the correctness of decisions made pursuant to the Act difficult to assess. But it does not mean that the Act is devoid of normative effect. There are several ways in which the Act and the work of the Commissioner have produced more substantive results, which can be viewed positively. Now I find myself in very strange territory. Optimism is not my natural state. <laughs> Be it about environmental governance, politics, our ability to innovate out of crises, or the prospect of my toddler sleeping through the night. I don't think I have once written positively about legal provisions in the context of nanotechnologies, food labelling, hydraulic fracturing for shale gas, or planning law. Now, looking back at that list, it's obvious that I chose to write about those things precisely because I thought there were shortcomings in how they were regulated. But in preparing for this talk, I have realised that I may have developed a certain level of competence in criticising parts of environmental law, but I haven't developed an equivalent capacity to generate solutions or to recognise the good or the potential when it's there. To put it another way, I have not been following the advice I regularly give to my students, which is that crit critical analysis is not the same as criticism. While we cannot make good news out of bad situations, there is something to be said, I think, for acknowledging the successes of environmental law, certainly more than I have been accustomed to. I am not suggesting that we ignore or give a gloss to instances where legal rules and practices fall short, and it's only by understanding law's deficiencies that we have any chance of improvement. But what I am really interested in is what might be gained from consciously seeking out environmental law's accomplishments, however few and far between they may feel or be. So I appreciate that this is not a straightforward matter of positive or negative, of good or bad, but can critical scholarship be too critical? Where is the hope? in environmental law. Yes, the act is aspirational, it is symbolic, but not necessarily in the worst sense of the words, which is to say ineffective. Rather, the act can be understood as symbolic in a more constructive way. Arguably, the act serves an expressive function. It makes a statement designed to produce or change social norms. Law works like this in many different contexts, signalling appropriate behaviour, instilling particular expectations, even when it is unaccompanied by much in way of enforcement activity. The Act may be understood as creating what Bart van Klink might call a communicative framework, in which 
Aspirational norms have no fixed meaning, but are developed in an ongoing interaction between the various legal, political and social actors. Symbolic legislation on that account describes law that facilitates mutual understanding among members of the interpretive community. There are several examples of the communicative workings of the Act, where the well-being of future generations is conceived not only as a goal, but as a space for dialogue and cooperation. Public services boards, for example, which have been established under the Act, to try to improve joint working across all public bodies and services in each local authority area. It is fair to say that so far public services boards have produced scattered and uneven results, but there are signs that they are performing some collaborative function. For instance, the five public services boards in Gwent, plus Natural Resources Wales, Forest Research and the 7Y Energy Agency are working together regionally to use funding for projects like the Gwent Green Grid, a programme for improving and developing green infrastructure, green spaces, urban and country parks, cycleways and public rights of way. The Act gives renewed impetus to the pursuit of sustainable development, which is at the heart of Wales's devolved powers. It fortifies existing norms and it provides a justificatory resource in the application of other rules. So going back to my initial example of the regulation of coal tips, the Future Generations Act is frequently drawn upon to explain why compulsory purchase is favoured over serving notices on landowners. The Act plays a central organising role in and brings additional coherence across different aspects of environmental governance in Wales. For example, Planning Policy Wales has just been updated to be brought in line with the Act, which among other things has meant a new focus on sustainable placemaking. The Act is routinising futures thinking in public sector decision making in Wales, even among bodies falling outside the Act's remit. Moreover, the Act shows that imaginations of the future exist not just in the mind or indeed in science fiction. They also exist in legal concepts, rules, practices and discourses. On that point, let's move to consider just briefly the second angle that I talked about on the relationship between law and the future, which, as I'd indicated at the start, is about the connections that might be made between legal scholarship and futures theory. Modern future studies began life as an applied science aimed at developing computational tools for forecasting and prediction, but it has grown in disciplinary scope and gained a sharper critical edge in the social sciences, arts and humanities, setting new agendas for engaging with the future not as a fixed object out there to be measured and managed ahead of time, but instead as a continuous dynamic process always in flux, always in progress, not separate from, but imminent in the present. This has taken several directions, opening up different avenues of inquiry into anthropologies of the future, geographies of the future, futurescapes of urban regeneration, speculative research methods, and socio-technical imaginaries, to name just a few areas where explicit efforts are being made to obtain a fuller, more nuanced understanding of what specific imaginations of the future do in the current moment, how they configure power relations, how they serve ideological goals, and how they generate conflictual interactions in the here and now. Generally speaking, though, this type of research has not been pursued in legal scholarship. There are some key and brilliant exceptions to this, but on the whole, academic research has rarely addressed the relationship between law and the future explicitly, or systematically. It is not enough though, is it, to identify a gap in the research? Because if that's all that were needed, then as Nick Blomley points out, we could conceivably have an analysis of law and sandwiches. The question that needs to be asked is, so what? <laughs> what difference could future theory make to our understanding of law? Likewise, what could law bring to the study of the future? <coughs> On that latter point, law brings new empirical material to the table, legal texts, routines and institutions and so on, where futures are overtly regulated in the case of the Future Generations Act, or where futures may quietly incubate 
without much critical attention, such as uh, in the Mines and Quarries Act. What is the potential benefit in examining legal materials from a futures perspective? And I should say here that I'm particularly indebted to Barbara Adam and her work and her guidance and support um, for prompting me to ask these questions. For one thing, critical future theories offers a wider view and conceptual vocabulary on the vast range of ways in which law mediates, enacts, and normalizes conceptions of the future that achieve effects in the present, whether or not those futures actualize. So rather than addressing the future predominantly in terms of knowledge practices or corrective tools available for effective regulation, such as risk analysis, impact assessment, hyperbolic discounting, it encourages a broader discussion of how the future is felt and experienced in and, and, and as the present. In respect of the Future Generations Act, for example, it, this means examining not just the practices that enable futures to be modelled and predicted, but also the temporal modes through which events and situations are governed, such as its construction of a sense of urgency or its cultivation of hope. These aspects are no less important in how law mobilises the future in real time to make decisions, to construct public reason and to manage uncertainty. There is work to be done then in investigating what Barbara Adam would call the futurescapes of law to capture the sheer variety of ways in which law operates on and through the future, shaping perceptions and belief about future possibilities <coughs> and making particular visions of the future feel plausible, desirable, inevitable even. And what better place to continue those lines of inquiry than the futures of environmental law? I said that I was going to say my thank yous at the end. Um, I'm particularly grateful to the Centre for Law and Environment and the UCL Faculty of, Faculty of Laws for inviting me here and for hosting us. Uh, I'm grateful to Maria and Stephen and to Kat for organising this evening. I'm grateful to my former and current students for helping uh, to spur me on with my research in this field. And um, I realise that I don't often thank colleagues and friends uh, at the various universities that I've worked at or have connections with. I often thank them in footnotes and I think that that's just not good enough. I'm very thankful uh, to my colleagues and friends for the professional and personal support that they've provided me in a particularly tricky couple of years. And to my family and to Philippe in particular, for making it possible to be here. Thank you very much. <laughs>